Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening. Yes, okay, you are there. Okay, well, hello. it's fantastic. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, uh, it's really nice to be here. I've never quite had an introduction quite like that before, <laughs> concentrating so much on my political past. I, I feel I need to explain myself. But anyway, you'll, you'll understand as, I, as you go through, uh, as I go through this, no, no doubt. But thanks very much for the invitation to come and uh, speak to you, to, to you this evening. Um, I'm particularly thrilled to do the, the Pemberton uh, 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 lecture and nice to see the, all the family family here. I think anyone who helped feed the Jarrow marchers, for me, seems to be on the right side of history from the, uh, from, from the beginning. And interestingly, this whole issue about nutrition, which was really significant and important to him, I was with a, a meeting with uh, David Miliband uh, last week, uh, uh, where, of course, he currently chairs International Rescue, and they're focusing their atten attention on uh, malnutrition amongst children. Um, the, the world has an objective to uh, reduce the, the number of children suffering from malnutrition by two-thirds by 2030. Um, most of the world is doing great things in terms of nutrition, but there still is a massive problem uh, around, around the world, particularly in those places where there are conflicts, places like the, the Yemen, where tens of thousands of children are severely malnourished. So the work that he started and the work that carries on is as critical, probably more important now in the rest of the world and globally than perhaps it was when it was first, first kicked off. Uh, I particularly appreciate being here. I'm, uh, uh, as you heard, I worked for quite a long time in, in Sheffield in South Yorkshire, uh, uh, almost over 20 years uh, I did. And in fact, my, my connection is that I took the decision as regional director to close and pull down the old Jessup Hospital and build the new, the new Jessup. So I think I'm probably standing on the site here of that, of that particular, particular decision, not a simple one as you can imagine at, at the time, but I always enjoyed my working in, in, in South Yorkshire. Um, as as uh, John said, I, I spent nearly 40 years working in the, in the NHS. And one of the things about all healthcare systems, as I've worked now in, in something like 20, um, all healthcare systems that I've found are parochial. They all look into themselves. Um, our healthcare system in this country is particularly parochial, though. Um, there is a reluctance in our healthcare system to learn from other countries, which certainly holds us back and certainly does not mean that we can influence the, uh, uh, services in the way that perhaps we might, might, might be able to. Um, and as Chief Executive of the NHS, you might think you would have the opportunity to connect with people from other countries, but in fact you, you don't. One of the great problems about the the job that I did at the, at the time was because of the public scrutiny, you simply couldn't leave the country. You weren't allowed to leave the country. If you left the country, or potentially left the country, the Daily Mail would be straight on to you. You know, patients are dying while he's jollying on around the world. And that really is a big problem for our, for our healthcare system and, and country, because there is huge things that we can learn uh, from other people. Um, since I left, uh, as I say, I've worked in 20 different countries. Um, I just want to, I mean, I am not an academic. Uh, uh, you've probably worked that one out, although my, my wife says that jacket is a polytechnic lecturer's jacket. But, she, uh, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not an academic. Um, I'm a practicing manager. So in a sense, what I'm going to talk about may not have the academic rigour um, that some of you are used to but it's based on practical experience and knowledge in these, in these countries. And just so that you kind of understand at the moment, so I've spent uh, the last few years working for the World Bank and the World Health Organization, uh, predominantly in, in Asia, in Korea, in China, uh, in India, in Pakistan in particular. Um, uh, you may be interested to know, those of you who, who uh, uh, are students of the... Um, of legislation in this country, the 2012 Act 
The Chinese government asked me to go and give evidence to the People's Congress of Deputies uh, because they were looking at a, um, a, a basic law for uh, health care, which they've now Im implemented, and they thought the 2012 Act was a good model. Little did they know, so. in circumstances. I've put them right on all of that. So. But anyway, so I've, I've, I've done that. I also uh, for, uh, I, I chair the, um, the uh, Public Hospital Authority for Cyprus. So they're currently implementing universal health coverage in Cyprus, and I chair their ho hospital uh, authority. I'll talk a little bit about Cyprus as we go, as we go through. And I chair a, an organisation that has a billion-dollar health fund, which is trying to create 10 health systems in 10 cities in Africa and Asia. Uh, Hyderabad, Karachi, Lahore, uh, Islamabad, um, uh, uh, Nairobi, uh, uh, Ethiopia, a whole set of countries in Africa and Asia. So we're trying to do that. And as, as, uh, as John said, I'm also in WISH. So that experience is, in, in a sense, what I'm bringing to bear in the conversation I hope that hopefully we can have uh, over the next hour, hour or so. Now, the sustainable uh, development goals are critical uh, globally to the future of, of a whole set of, in fact, they're crucial for the planet as a, as a whole. They cover a whole range of issues, but the one I particularly want to talk about uh, tonight is universal health. Well, I'm going to talk about care, but, but coverage is, 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 part, is part of that. Um, this is one of the most important uh, uh, goals. I will argue in the, the, what I'm going to talk about tonight that it is, in healthcare terms, the most significant uh, intervention in healthcare that there's probably ever been globally and has the potential to affect literally billions of people across the, across the, uh, across the, across the planet. The, the definition is that um, it will ensure that all people have access to needed promotive, preventative, curative and rehabilitative health services of sufficient quality be effective while also ensuring that people do not suffer financial hardship when paying for these services. And as you will undoubtedly know, there are great elements of our, of our planet where that is simply not being uh, delivered at, at, at the moment. Now, a lot of, a lot of um, effort is going into what's described as universal health coverage. That means that people are covered by some kind of insurance, tax-based funding, or uh, of, that, of, that, of that nature. But also, there is the issue of delivery, of provision, about have we got healthcare organisations who are capable of delivering the kind of healthcare that we need going forward. Because one of the things that I would say about having worked in a whole set of countries is the basic issues that people are dealing with in all these countries are broadly the same. You have the same conversations in almost any country that you go in. The issue is the degree and the scale of the current provision. So, for example, most of the world has focused its attention, together with the United Nations and the Global Fund and all, 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 all the rest of it, on eradicating communicable diseases. That's been the focus of the attention of, of almost everybody in healthcare in these, in these countries. And they've been extraordinarily effective at delivering those sorts of things. Now, of course, the circumstances are changing. As many of these countries, low- and middle-income countries, become wealthier and individuals become wealthier, and I know wealthier in these terms is a, is a comparative uh, issue, but as people become wealthier, they're prepared to spend more and more money on health care. But the things that they're suffering from are changing significantly, particularly if you think about Asia and the rise of type 2 diabetes, which is a huge issue with a, uh, within some countries having a genetic predisposition to type 2 diabetes. You know, in some countries, 40% of the population 
have type 2 di diabetes. As those uh, countries get older, it's going to be significantly uh, uh, difficult for those countries. So if you think about it in this country at the moment, and we have, in terms of our primary care service, one of the best uh, type 2 diabetes services around, with all the problems that I know that, uh, that our primary care services, services have and all the, the strains on them. Um, today, about a quarter of hospital beds in this city will be full, full of people who have complications uh, related to type 2 diabetes. So if you can imagine in some of these major cities with 22 million people in, 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 in some of them with a rise in type 2 diabetes 10, 15 years down the line, you can see how significant it's going to be to create healthcare systems in these countries to, uh, uh, to look after them. And in a sense, the, uh, um, the United Nations uh, fired the starting pistol and now 130 countries have committed to developing and implementing universal health coverage by 2030. Now last year was a particularly big year for a number of countries um, thinking about universal health coverage. I've identified some of the more uh, significant ones, or to be honest the ones I know more about uh, here. Uh, but they cover a third of the population of the, of the globe. So, so governments in all these countries have committed themselves to implementing universal health care in, in their various countries. And a few things I'd, I'd say about it. The first thing is that in most of these countries, primary and community services are relatively rudimentary. I don't think any of them have anything like the primary care healthcare systems that we have in this, in this country. And whilst you can't take a, 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 a healthcare system from one country and give it to another one, there are definitely issues around the way you support and help people with non-communicable diseases that many of these countries simply haven't got the infrastructure to do at the moment. They do all have uh, uh, developing and burgeoning hospital services, which tend to be the focus of much of the, much of the activities, which in a sense is a problem in itself. Most of these countries, most of the provision is private. So um, you'll know there is a, a long-standing debate in this country about privatisation, about the private, should we use the private sector, shouldn't we? In these countries, it's not a debate because... Um, in many of them, over half of their current services are delivered by the private sector. And basically, the model is one of self-paying. So people, there is very little health insurance in many of these countries either. So most of the health care is delivered by the private sector and self-paying. So you literally pay as you go, as you go along. Um, in some countries, you can... And I, I, I was uh, re recently in a hospital in, in Lagos um, where... You go into the accident and emergency department in the hospital and um, uh, you can see at one side there was about 20 or 30 young men with laptop computers all looking at their laptop computers uh, uh, pressing keys. And I thought this is remarkable that, uh, that uh, uh, Nigeria had, had got electronic records and just, you know, nothing like we've got in this, in this country. In fact, they were all... Um, uh, uh, working for loan companies, um, providing loans to patients who come through A&E. So what happens? You go to A&E, you broke your leg, you've got an injury, they say that, they tell you how much it's going to cost, and then you have to get one of these loan companies to lend you the money so that you can be treated. Um, and obviously you have to pay it back sometime in the, in, in, in the future. And that kind of process is, in many of these countries, is what's, what, where, where people start that conversation that, that conversation uh, from. And uh, uh, so the private sector at the moment, uh, uh, in, in many of these countries, is very profitable. It's, um, it can make money out of the arrangements it has at the moment. And the big advantage for, for many of these co uh, 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 companies who, who run it is their relationship is not with government or not with anyone, but with the individual, and they, um, and they pay. And um, 
what are, one of the byproducts of universal health coverage is that there is increasing, in almost all of these countries, increasing government expenditure on health care. So many of these private organisations in future will get most of their income not from individual payment, but from government. And that's a big cultural shift for many of these, many of these organisations, and of course for many of the, of the governments involved. And I'll talk about one or two of them in a, in a while. Um, but for example, in Indonesia, the private sector simply didn't want to play. When the government decided to implement universal health coverage, many of the private sector organisations said, we don't want, we, you're not going to pay us enough and we don't want to, to do it and we're going to stand outside of it. Which is interesting, actually, in lots of ways. It was very similar to what happened in this country when Blair tried to introduce the private sector into, into health care. But as the government started to develop its service, as it became more popular with the, the people, more and more of the private sector now in Indonesia do actually uh, deliver services paid for by the public but delivered, delivered privately. In Cyprus, where I'm responsible for public hospitals, about half of all health care is delivered to uh, patients by the private sector. Um, <coughs> And uh, there is no uh, plan to change that. So how you engage and work with the private sector to deliver public health care is a big challenge across the world, and most people are struggling of, with how to do it. On the positive side, of course, people are starting now to think more about health care systems rather than just running hospitals. So the example I'd give you is in... Uh, in Karachi, where they have a healthcare system which has uh, community health workers at, at, at one hand, with a very few doctors supporting, but certainly a lot of uh, young women who are community health workers connected by telemedicine to a to a centre where people can get help and advice and support, and a hospital system which will provide hospital care when it's when it's needed. And that kind of systemic way of thinking about healthcare is increasing the way things need to go, to go forward. The other issue is private investment. There is a lot of private investment going into these countries as well. And the important thing about all of that is to ensure that that investment is starting to build the primary and community care infrastructure that these, these uh, countries will need in order to deliver health care going, going forward. So Pakistan, the Philippines, Indonesia, South Africa, Jamaica, uh, Egypt, Cyprus, all examples of countries who are in, in 2017 launched their health care system. And of course the biggest of all is India. Um, uh, Modi Care, as it's uh, called, half a million uh, beneficiaries. An extraordinary um, uh, initiative uh, for a government to take, although, of course, uh, that I'm sure many of you know in India, mo uh, healthcare is basically run by the state, the states rather than the national government. But nevertheless, a big, ambitious programme. But one of the issues that we find all around, particularly this is a particular issue for many politicians, and I've found it in most countries that I've worked in. Um, uh, and, and indeed, it, it applies to this country as, as well as uh, uh, any. Politicians believe, generally speaking, not being too unfair to them, is once they've said something, it just happens. That kind of, they don't really get implementation. And... Uh, uh, so there are, uh, and you need an infrastructure to deliver the implementation. And that, it seems to me, is a critical part of all of this. And uh, Modicare is a good example of that. They've literally put huge amounts of money into the system. But basically, at the moment, it's not delivering the primary and community services that they need, but is being driven through the highly profitable hospital hospital service. And one of the dangers in all of this, and it is, it is, it is uh, true uh, in most of these countries, um, it is perfectly possible to make money out of providing poor care. 
And, that's, and the whole issue of quality obviously is massive in the Indian healthcare system, but across these uh, systems as a, as a whole. And I just give you, you an example. The, um, the NICE guidance on um, uh, a kidney dialysis is that uh, to be effective, you need at least two sessions a week to be effective, probably three, uh, to be really, re re really effective. In India, the average uh, number of sessions per patient who needs it is 1.8. That means that probably most people in India who get dialysis is ineffective and actually could be doing them harm rather than, rather than good. And indeed, um, and that is driven basically by what people can actually afford out of their own out of their own pocket. So this whole issue about not just creating a system, putting money into it, and suddenly something will happen, in the environment that these countries are, it simply won't happen in that way. And if you're not very careful, and this is a de big danger, I think, in India at the moment, they will end up with a real problem. And if you think about it, 80% of all healthcare in India is delivered by the private sector, predominantly in small hospitals, on average of 30 beds, doctor-run small hospitals. The dangers of, of all of that are obvious for anyone who can, who can see it. So it's not just a question of the, of the political uh, uh, objective, although that is important. You need to get everything else right as well. Now, I did some work on... Uh, uh, so if you're, gonna, if you're gonna have universal health coverage, what are the sorts of things that seem to work uh, in countries that have been through this process in the, in the past? What are the things that will help you as a government to enable it to, to, to happen? And the first thing I would say is politics. And I'm going to talk about politics in a while, but politics is critical. You need the right kind of political leadership to enable it to happen. Ministers of health don't drive change in healthcare. Heads of state and finance ministers drive change in healthcare. And in those countries where the head of state and the finance minister are bought into the healthcare reform, you've a much better chance of, of, de of, of delivery than you have if a minister of health is left to their own. Their own, their own device. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that as we go, as we go through. Um, but there are, four, there are four things that we discovered when we surveyed a whole range of uh, countries across the, the world. The first one is, so where do you start? You can't start straight away and give the whole population all of their health care that they need at one go. No country can afford to do that. So where do you start? Do you start with sections of the community? Do you start with regions? Do you start with uh, conditions? Where do you start? And undoubtedly, those countries that have taken a whole population approach to delivering their healthcare reform are, are much more likely to be successful than those who, have, who are trying to deliver for part of it. So we concluded that whole population to create the, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, mutual support across population where the collective um, approach was a much better way of getting a much more likely to deliver you, you a, a result than perhaps some of the other arrangements that uh, we thought. Secondly, mandatory financing. There are lots of examples of voluntary schemes they simply don't, well, they certainly don't, li don't, don't lead to universal health coverage. They tend to be small scale. They tend to have particular groups of the population in them. Uh, they certainly don't tackle the issues of the poorer people in, 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 in the society. So the only way that you can make that change to universal health coverage for your population is some kind of mandatory financing. Now that could be taxation, it could be social insurance, or whatever, 
voluntary simply doesn't work. There's no example we could find where a voluntary system led to delivery of universal ha health coverage. Thirdly, establish a dominant payer. Now, um, in, a, in our country, we have a single payer system, one, one organisation, one uh, kind of, uh, which the government pays through taxation for, 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 for everything. We found the more payers you had, so, and, and there are some countries which um, uh, uh, see this as a, as a benefit to give people choice or, or, or whatever, you simply don't create that whole popula population approach. And I'm, I say I'll give you an example in a month for that. And the fourth thing is countries who try to work out new ways of delivering primary care and community services. In a sense, developing uh, care models that the private sector can invest in is a way in which you can deliver universal health cover coverage to many, to many people. And I'll give you uh, uh, th three, three examples. Thailand is a really good example of uh, universal health coverage. And this um, part of universal health coverage is this whole issue about financial hardship. Um, uh, the example I gave you in, uh, in, 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 in Nigeria and the example around the world, whether it's India, Pakistan or, 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 or other countries, where people pay a lot out of pocket you have really serious problems about financial hardship. So not only have you got to the problem of dealing with being ill, you've also got the problem of paying for it and potentially losing your home or your job and your ability to live generally. So it's a critical thing for many, for, 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 for many people. And this is an example in Thailand which shows the impact of universal health care on financial hardship. I mean, I'd, I, I, I'll, I'll use a couple of examples of the United States. It's a free hit, really, in some ways. Uh, yeah, but if you think about in the United States last year, 700,000 people lost their homes through not being able to pay their medical bills. So the creation of a system which helps, which <coughs> stops that financial hardship is absolutely critical. It's one of the reasons, although Thailand have gone through you know, enormous... Uh, political problems, their basic healthcare system and the way they deal with it has stayed the, has stayed the same. This whole issue about funding uh, pools and mandatory funding, critical. This is the example of Chile. So in Chile, the population, uh, uh, they gave the population at one point, though they rescinded it, they gave the population at one point the right to decide whether they're going to pay into the national system or not. You could opt out and do your, and do your own. Only 15% of the population opted out, the wealthier people in Cyprus. But they took 50% of the funding of the healthcare system with them. This kind of reinforces this, and they had to change the way they did it. So this kind of reinforces this whole issue about man, a mandatory system of funding to enable you to get that whole population uh, funding. And uh, dominant public payer. Uh, and you, you can see here um, the administrative cost. Uh, now, again, just a, a free hit for America. I'll just do it while I'm here. It, you know, it, it's an extraordinary number, I think. It costs the United States of America $500 billion to collect the money to spend on health care. $500 billion. Um, uh, that's before you treat a patient. That's just the cost of all the various insurance organisations, schemes and processes that go on in, in America. Though obviously, they're, a, they're an outlier. But what you can see um, is if you want to... If you want to spend as little money as possible on that kind of thing, the administrative system, you're much better to go to a dominant payer system. It's much more effective, both in terms of collecting the money, but also making sure that you're not spending huge amounts of money um, on administ administration. Now, one of the things that I talk about when I talk to in, in other countries is 
there is no right time to introduce universal health coverage. And this is a, this is a picture of uh, London in 1945. And if you think about it, we decided to create our universal health care system in this country um, against the most difficult circumstances. You know, uh, London was like that. Most of our big cities, including Sheffield, were in rubble. Hundreds of thousands of our people had been killed. Um, the uh, uh, most basic foodstuffs were rationed. But at that particular moment in time, we had the political leadership to enable universal health coverage to happen. So even in the most difficult circumstances that country fi countries find themselves, you can use universal health coverage to essentially take your country forward if you have the right political lead leadership. Many countries have benefited in the sense of uh, politicians who have uh, are supported and led on universal health coverage have done very well, whether that's Indonesia or Nigeria. Politicians have, who have, have advocated universal health coverage, it's an incredibly popular thing, and there have been success in, re in relation uh, uh, to it all. But part of it is understanding why people do it. So, it's very interesting, in this country, in, in, in the Uni in, in United Kingdom, when we um, launched universal health coverage in 1948, the strap line was not better health for all. It wasn't a high quality care for all, anything like that. It was in place of fear. That was the thing, the headline, in a sense. And it was um, an antidote to war, and it was a way of rebuilding a society after that war had happened. Similarly, in Rwanda, a place you know, which was riven by civil war, actually one of the ways in which they rebuilt that society was building it through their healthcare system. Many countries have done it in this, in this kind of way. In Germany, for example, you know, they, they talk, when they talk about healthcare, they talk about social solidarity. They talk about the rich for the poor, the young for the old, all of those sorts of, thing, sorts of things. The way in which you create your society, you do it through your healthcare system. In China, they talk about um, social harmony, that actually building a healthcare system creates um, uh, 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 solidarity between people, it creates a mutual knowledge and understanding, and it creates a, uh, a mutual commitment. So social harmony is a critical part of the, uh, of the new law and the way they're going, going forward. And some countries use healthcare as a way of developing their interest around the, around the world. It's a great a sadness to me. I don't really understand why it is, but this country, it, with our healthcare system, with all, its, with all its problems, there's huge interest around the world about it, about how it works, about what works well, what doesn't work well. You know, almost any country you want to go to, people are absolutely fascinated to it. But our government doesn't seem interested in promoting it at all. It all it's almost as if they're embarrassed by their own healthcare system. And I compare that with Korea, where co the Korean government, who are very interested in what is described as you know, soft power, um, have spent a huge amount of money creating an organisation whose sole job it is to promote the, the, um, the values, principles, the organisation of the Korean healthcare, country, uh, healthcare system in, all, in other worlds, to the extent that I've been doing some work for them in Colombia, in Latin America, to help them create a healthcare system uh, uh, there. So countries increasingly start to think about how you can use it to help other countries and to create your own your own uh, soft power. So pol politics in those circumstances is critical. Now, I've talked a lot about the population, about politics, about government, and all the rest of it. I just want to finally just talk about uh, people. This is a, uh, a young girl uh, called Mena. Um, she lives in Hyderabad. Her parents and have given me uh, permission to 
to show this. She um, was playing with her friends in the street in India, and a uh, a bus that was uh, come down the uh, come down the road and couldn't uh, uh, and gone down the wrong road and had to turn round and it backed round to turn round and it, it 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 knocked her over and then the wheel went straight over her pelvis and completely crushed her pelvis. Um, uh, her parents, who were who were not particularly poor, they uh, the, the father was in um, work but didn't have a huge amount of money to pay for. Her, her care. They put her in a in a, in a, um, in a blanket and carried her to a hospital uh, to be treated. Um, uh, they were turned away by nine hospitals before they got the tenth hospital that would treat her. Now, when we talk about universal health coverage, we talk we, we often talk about the technical aspects of it, you know, the pooling and all the rest of it. But it's really hard to imagine and understand how a hospital could turn away, well, she's a four-year-old child with those kind of injuries. Fortunately, the 10th did, the one that we run there, and now she's fine and she's walking and she's back uh, to full health. When, it all, uh, when it's all said and done, when you've considered all of those issues around the politics of all of this, it comes down to how you treat individuals and the benefit for people like Mena for getting a healthcare system which doesn't just do the right thing globally but actually makes a real difference to in individuals. I'm absolutely convinced that um, the current uh, uh, movement across the world to implement universal health coverage is the most important initiative in healthcare um, uh, this, this century. It has the opportunity to treat billions of people, improve their lives, take away they, their fear and help countries in fragile states rebuild their, their, their societies. It seems in this country we have a responsibility to help and support people in that environment and also we can learn huge from their experience and struggles in delivering universal health coverage. Thank you.